He touched me and made me whole. We all need to be made whole. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter number 9. We come now to what we might say a parenthetical part in the book of Romans as Paul deals with the nation of Israel. Uh, in chapter 9, Israel's past, chapter 10, Israel's present, uh, and chapter 11, Israel's future. As we begin to look at this, as uh, Paul is showing that God has not set aside the nation of Israel, that he's not through with them, that uh, they've simply been put to the side, so to speak, that the, God is dealing with the church and the church age, the day of grace, but God has not uh, completely forgotten about uh, his earthly chosen people, the nation of Israel. You know, we've been looking at the sovereignty of God. We've been looking at election and, and man's will and all different things like that. And, and we'll get into that tonight. And, and Paul begins to look at that here in chapter 9 as he gives us some examples of Isaac and Ishmael, of Jacob and Esau, of Pharaoh and Moses, and examples from the book of Hosea and the book of Isaiah. And he, and he begins to show these things that God's sovereign choosing, God's sovereign election, that God can do as he pleases, whenever he pleases and however he pleases, because he is God. And we're not to mold and make and shape God into our image and try to make him fit what we want him to, to do and to be. Uh, everything God does is loving, is kind, is right, it's just, it's perfect, it's good. He never does anything that's unkind or unrighteous or uh, unjust or anything like that. God, we know God is always perfect, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, his ways not our ways. But uh, we have to trust God and we believe God. But, you know, as we look at our nation in the last few months, we realize and I think you would agree with me today that our nation seems to be in a moral free fall. Amen? A, a, a downward spiral with our nation today. And you know, as Christians, we can feel down and defeated and we can feel depressed and, hey, we're behind and we're not going to win and, and it seems like the world's taking over and overcoming us. And, but you know, we've already read that we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. We've already read that there is nothing that can be laid against the charge of God's elect. We've already been seeing in our passage here that no one can condemn us and that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we don't have to worry about that. We know we're eternally safe and secure. We know God has a plan. God has a purpose. God is sovereign and God can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants to and however he wants to do it because he is God and we're not. But as we look at this today in this passage, and the reason I bring that up is sometimes we look and say, well, what's, what's solutions for our nations? And what's, uh, what's the answer for our nations? And, and how can we come out of this uh, moral free fall and this downward spiral? What's the solution? What's the answer to that? Well, I'll tell you right now, some of you may get mad at me, but it's not a political party, okay? We're not talking about Democrats, Republicans, Independents. I'm not talking about that. I don't think that's going to solve all of our problems, okay? And I don't think it goes to technology. It doesn't go to government. It doesn't go to this or that and the other. But there is one solution and there is one answer I believe we have for the problems we have in our nation today, and that is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's going to change the world, folks. That's going to change people's hearts. It's going to change leaders' hearts, government's hearts, whatever it may be. It's going to change people's hearts. Now, Paul comes to this passage today in Romans chapter 9, and, and, and Paul is burdened. He has a heavy burden, a heavy grief, a heavy anguish over his Jewish brothers and sisters that they do not know Christ as their personal Savior. And, you know, we have to look at this because many of the Jews, of course, the Jewish nation in general had rejected Christ. It wasn't God's fault. It wasn't God's failure. It was the people's fault, the people's failure. They had simply rejected Christ. But, but Paul had a deep desire to see them saved. And the thing about it, you have to remember, a lot of these Jews didn't like Paul because they considered Paul a turncoat, a traitor, a heretic, a liar. And many of them wanted Paul dead. They didn't want him alive. The Roman government was after him, and a lot of his Jewish brothers and sisters, they didn't like him, so Paul was kind of in the middle here. He really didn't have a home to go to, so to speak. But Paul kept preaching the gospel, and Paul really was that missionary to the Gentiles. But Paul still deep down inside he had a desire and a burning compassion, a burning desire to see his Jewish brothers and sisters come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And Paul said, I'm willing to uh, endure any punishment. I'm willing to make any sacrifice. I'm willing to do anything and to take anything and to give up anything, whatever it takes for someone to come to know Christ. Paul said, I'm willing to do that. And you know, I ask you today, are you willing to do that? 
we start off today, this is the first Sunday of the new church year. And you think, well, uh, the preacher's up here, he's going to try to motivate me today and try to challenge me today, but, but you know what, I'm not going to listen to him, and I'm going to sleep on him, and I'm not going to do anything today. You know that? Well, guess what? I've installed buzzers under your seat today. You didn't know that, did you? And when I see you misbehaving or nodding off, I have a button here, and it has every seat right here, and I'm going to buzz that. So if you see someone in church today, jump up. It's not the spirit. It's my buzzer. Amen? Now that I've got your attention, now that you're awake. But the thing about it, if we realize the importance of sharing our faith with others, if I ask you today, and I've done this before, we all know someone who is lost. Would you agree with me? You may have a spouse, you may have a parent, you may have a child, you may have a neighbor, you may have a co-worker, you may have someone you go to school with, all kinds of people you know are lost, and they're unchurched, and you know if they were to die today, they're not going to heaven. They're going to be eternally separated from God in a place the Bible calls hell, eternal damnation, eternal condemnation for eternity from here on out. That's their destiny. That's their purpose. That's what's going to happen to them. And, you know, if we had that desire like Paul had, if all churches had that and all pastors had that, wouldn't it be a different world? Amen. Because, listen, folks, as we look at our world today, and we've seen what's taking place just in our uh, in our state in the last week, the question comes up, what's next and who's next? They're going to come after the churches and they're going to come after the pastors, okay? Mark my word. Are we ready? Are we prepared? Are we ready to stand? Are we ready to fight? But you know, when I look at this, it gives me confidence. We're under no condemnation. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing can bring, no one can bring a charge against God's elect. But you know what? It's time we wake up and it's time we move forward and it's time we get up and we start sharing Christ. That's the answer. That's the solution. People coming to know Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about changing a law. I'm not talking about changing this. But I'm talking about letting God change a person's heart by telling them about Jesus Christ. God does the saving, but we have a privilege, an opportunity, an obligation, and a duty to go out and to share Jesus Christ with others. I ask you today, you see the title of the message, do you care about those who are unsaved? Do you care about those who are lost? Do you love them enough? Are you concerned about them enough to go and to share Christ with them? You say, well, you know, I pray for them, and, and, and I, uh, I encourage them a little bit, but do you invite them to church? Do you invite them to Sunday school? Do you ever share the gospel with them, the plan of salvation? Here's some verses you can read, and I'm going to pray with you, and, and I'm going to try to lead you to Christ. We hear that. Do you ever do that? And you say, well, you know, I pray about We well, you know what that tells me? You're really not concerned about them, are you? You really don't care about them, do you? Eternal destiny of people are in our hands right now. That's why preaching the gospel is such an awesome responsibility. Because when I preach this word, there are people out there that the balance of heaven and hell are hanging there of where they're going to spend their eternity. Did you know that? Now, I can't save you, and this person can't save you, but I'm preaching a message that can save you. So it's an awesome responsibility. When our Sunday school teachers teach, when, when preachers stand here and preach, when we go out and share the gospel, it's the difference between heaven and hell, the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Are you concerned about the lost? Are you willing to be silent? Are we, you willing to sit back and say nothing and let the world take over and let the world make these laws and these rules and say, well, we as Christians, we're just going to sit back because we know we win at the end, so hey, we're just going to kind of sit back. But folks, God has given us a job to do, a mandate to do, a cup command, uh, the great commission to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, discipling them, and God says, listen, I'm going to be with you always, even, and to the end of the world. So you know what? We cannot lose, we will not lose, we cannot fail, and we will not fail. And so it's time for the church, it's time for pastors to stand up and to stand on God's word and say, you know what? This nation, there's still hope for this nation because God is still on his throne. Look with me in chapter 9, book of Romans. Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, 
who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now you look at that and you say, boy, what are you going to talk about that? Well, we may get to that this morning, we may not. But if you look at our passage here today, and I want you to just notice <coughs> the great desire and that great burning compassion that Paul has for his Jewish brothers and sisters. And let me ask you something today. What if we had that desire to see people come to know Christ? Are you with me? What if we had that burning desire? I'm willing to suffer any punishment. I'm willing to go any place, to do anything, to sacrifice my time and my money and my energy and my efforts and my safety and my security and my comfort that I might see one person come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, all of us in here today who are Christians, we all have that privilege to do that. Do you know that? We all have that duty, that obligation to share the gospel with other people and to live that gospel before other people. But you know what? As, as long as Christians sit back and we're too afraid and too timid to tell people about Christ, you know what? The world's going to continue taking over, and it's going to continue mowing us down and bowling us over and rolling us over, and we're just going to sit back and we're just going to take it. Listen, folks, it's time for Christians to stand up to stand up and to take a stand, it's no longer time to be silent. Are you with me? Say amen. No longer time to be silent. There's a world out here that's lost and that needs Christ. There's a community here in Berea, a community in Richmond, a community here in Madison County. You know, the statistics, there's a lot more people sitting outside of church today than are in church buildings today. Did you know that? And they're out there enjoying the pleasures of the world. And they have no idea, no thought about Christ, no intention about God, no love of God. And then we wonder sometimes where our nation's in a moral free fall. Amen. We wonder sometimes what's happening. Has the church failed? Have we not gotten out and done what we're supposed to do? Are, are, are we not living the way we're supposed to do? Are we not inviting people to church, encouraging people to come to church, and, and sharing the gospel and doing all these things and praying for these people? And we just sit back and we say, well, we'll come in our little building here on Sunday morning. We'll have our worship service, and then we'll go out from here. We'll live any way we want. And you know what? We really can't do anything. We'll just kind of let the world roll us over. Well, you know what? You read in the book of Revelation, folks, Satan is defeated, okay? He loses. He's trying to raise as much havoc as he can right now, but he's going to lose, Okay? But you know what? We sit back and we say, well, I'm not going to say anything. It's time for Christians to stand up and to speak of what thus saith the Lord. And that's what Paul says. Look at verse 1. He says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not my conscience. Also, bearing be witness in the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. What he's saying here is, look, what I'm saying is the truth. The Holy Spirit has laid this upon my heart. This is a burden that's on my heart continually. Every day, every night. Every waking moment, when I go to sleep, when I wake up, it's for my Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ. How many times have you weeped and you cried and you were in anguish and bitter sorrow over someone you knew who was lost? When's the last time we did that? You know, great revivals of the past, you see, great awakening, Jonathan Edwards and Charles Spurgeon, all these D.L. Moody, all these great pastors of the past, and, they, and, they, and you read their uh, the writings, and, and many of them, they, they, they wept over lost people, and they stayed up for days praying for these people, and the people in the church came, and they wept for the lost souls, and they wept for the lost people, and they wept for the churches that were they're drying and dying and going away, and they wept for those things. But you know what? We don't have that desire and compassion anymore, do we? Why is that? 
Folks, the same God that blessed back then is the same God today, amen? It's the same plan of salvation. But we have so many other things that distract us and move us away from what our focus should be. So many things in the world. But I'm telling you today, folks, if we don't stand up and we don't speak out and we don't tell people about Christ, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. What's next and who's next? They're going to come after the churches. They're going to come after the pastors. Are you with me? They're going to come after the Christians, okay? You read the book of the Revelation. You read the tribulation period. It's going to be a terrible time for people who are saved during that time, okay? We're starting to see previews of that, okay? Right here in our nation, right here in our state, right here in our county, right here in our community, we're beginning to see those things. Things that 30, 40 years ago we never dreamed of. We never thought would take place. And you know what? We, we, we need to go forward. And, and, and as your pastor, sometimes, you know, if I have to take a stand, I may need someone there to hold up my arms, okay? And I hope you're there with me, and I believe you'll be there to support me. But we have to support one another. I'm not preaching hatred. I'm not preaching anger. I'm not preaching all these things. But I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God, and that's what we have to stand on. That's the only thing going to get our nation back is this book in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is saying here. Paul saw here. He saw his Jewish brothers and sisters. You see, he had once been where they were now. He had once been where they were now. And he knew religion can't save you. These laws and these rituals and these ceremonies and this sacrificial system, those things aren't going to save you. That's not going to get you to heaven. He said you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why a lot of them didn't like him. They said he's a traitor. He's turned on the Jewish religion. He, he's gone to the Gentiles now and saying the Gentiles can be saved just like the Jews. They can be accepted by God just like the Jews. And that, that's why a lot of people didn't like him. He, he had turned 180 degrees around. You know why he turned? Because God got hold of his heart. And God showed him the truth. And he had an experience with Jesus Christ. And he had a salvation experience, conversion experience, regeneration. And Paul was a changed man. And now Paul had this burden to tell other people about Christ. He knew this Jewish brother of his was lost. This Jewish sister was lost. He knew they were lost. He said they need the gospel. They need Christ. And it just broke his heart that overall the nation of Israel had rejected Christ. Because look what he says there in the first few verses. He says, I'm telling the truth. The Holy Spirit's my witness that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. It's a great anguish, a great sorrow, a great grief, and continual sorrow and pain in my heart. Every single day, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brother and my kinsman according to the flesh. Now look over in chapter 10 in verse 1 of Romans there. You just turn a page. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is what? That they might be prosperous, that they might be rich, that they might have a lot of land, that they might have a lot of possessions. He said, my prayer to them is that they might be saved. Shouldn't that be our prayer for our nation today? That God, I pray for the United States of America. Don't make us prosperous. Don't make us rich. Don't make us wealthy. Don't make us this and that. But I pray that many people in the United States will be saved. And then what are we doing about it? Are we being silent? Are we standing back and letting someone else do the work? You remember Wednesday night we looked at Moses and Moses had given every excuse to God. God said, Moses, I want you to go and deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. He gave every excuse. I'm not a good speaker. I can't do this. I'm incapable. I'm inadequate. I'm unqualified. I'm not your man, God. I don't want to go. God said, yeah, you are my man. I'll give you Aaron, your brother, to be your spokesman. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to give you this rod that you can do power. In your hand, it's nothing. But in my hand, it's very powerful. And guess what? Moses went, didn't he? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. But you know what? God put a big fish in the ocean. Guess what? Jonah went to Nineveh, didn't he? And you know, God gives us a, a, a command today, and I think of Jonah going to, going to Assyria, to Nineveh. I think of Moses going to Pharaoh. I think of us today going into the world and proclaiming the gospel and, and going here and not being silent, but proclaiming the gospel and preaching the gospel and teaching the gospel. That's what the world needs, folks. And that's what Paul had on his heart and on his mind. His Jewish brothers, he knew this religion wouldn't save them because many of them thought they were comfortable. Many of them thought they were okay. <clears throat> hey, I follow this law. I follow this ritual. I make a few sacrifices. I go to church every now and then. Been baptized a couple times. I'm okay. I'm going to make it to heaven. 
But let me tell you something, folks. I'll give you the straight truth. Without Jesus Christ in your heart, you will not go to heaven. Period, okay? Without Jesus Christ, you will not go to heaven. And that's why Paul had this great desire. But look what he says in verse 3. He says, I could wish myself were accursed. That's the word anathema. That means eternally separated from God, doomed to destruction, doomed to damnation. Now, Paul knew this was impossible because Paul just mentioned chapter 8. He said, you know what? Nothing can condemn us. No one can condemn us. Nothing can, no one can bring anything to the charge of God's elect. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he knew that, but he's saying if this were possible, he said if this were possible, I'd give my life to see people come to know Christ. What if we had that burden? You say in the United States of America, with all the privileges and responsibilities, you know, with all these privileges and benefits we have today, and you're telling me for someone to come to Christ that I might have to give my life, that I might have to make a sacrifice and time and money and effort and security and comfort and all these things? Well, I'm not going to do that. That's for someone that's a missionary. That's for someone that's a preacher. That's not for me. Or is it? Is it for you too? Are you willing to make that sacrifice? You wouldn't tell people about Christ? I asked you to raise your hand. How many of you have a spouse that's lost? You'd raise your hand. How many of you have a child that's lost? You'd raise your hand. How many of you have a parent that's lost? You'd raise your hand. You have someone, a neighbor that's lost, you'd raise your hand. You go to school with, you'd raise your hand. You work with, you'd raise your hand. Or, you know, sadly, I might ask you today, there may be someone sitting beside you in church today that's lost. Do you know they're lost? What have you done about it? What are you going to do about it? You're going to sit back and be silent? You're going to be still and not do anything about it? Are you going to tell them about Christ? Are you going to tell them how you were saved? Are you going to tell them they can have eternal life? We have the greatest good news in all the world. Let's not be quiet about it, okay? We can talk about the ball game last night, couldn't we? Well, I heard that. Boy, they about gave it away, but they came back at the end, didn't they? And then we have politics. This law, this law. We talk about anything, but we call up when we talk about Christ. You know why? We don't want to offend anyone, do we? We don't want to offend anyone. But you know what? I've come to the point now, I don't care who I offend, amen? I'm going to do it in a loving manner, in a righteous manner, in a manner that, that, that's compassionate to others. But you know what? It's time we speak up, amen? It's time our voices be heard. It's time to go out and win a world for Jesus Christ. We may just be a small church, a little place here in Berea, Kentucky, but we can have an impact in our community, amen? We can have an impact here, and it spreads to here, and it spreads there. That's the answer. That's the solution. It's no other way but Jesus Christ. What are we doing about it? What are we doing? Paul said, I'll take anything. I'll take a curse. I'll be punished. I'll take punishment. I'll make a sacrifice. I'll give up anything, whatever it takes to see people come to know Christ. Because look what he says in the next few verses about Israel. He talks here about their privileges. And you know what? We're a privileged nation today, okay? We're a very privileged nation. There's a lot of nations today. There are churches on every corner. They don't have access to the Bible. They don't have access to the Internet where they can look at a Bible. They don't have, uh, they don't have seminaries. They don't have godly They don't have those things. But look at Israel, the privileges they had in verse 4. Paul says, who, who are these brethren of mine, the kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption? Remember in Exodus chapter 4, the other night on Wednesday night, that uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to be here on Wednesday night. Amen? Okay. Well, I didn't get any amens on that. Let me rephrase that. No. But, but God called Israel his firstborn. He said that Israel's my son. So there, there's the adoption, the sonship, that, that they belong to God, God's chosen earthly people. But, but then he says not only that, but they, they received the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, in, in the desert, in the wilderness, in the tabernacle, in the temple, the promised land. Not only that, they received the covenants. God made a covenant with Abraham, reconfirmed with Isaac and Jacob. Gave a covenant to Moses, gave a covenant to David. Not only that, but giving of the law. They not only have the Ten Commandments, they have the whole law of God. Not only that, but they, the service of God. They're, they have the capacity to worship God. The temple service, the priesthood, the sacrificial system. Didn't give that to any other nation, gave it to the nation of Israel. And then he says, and the promises here. The promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of a land, a seed of blessing, but also the messianic promises going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Not only that, but look at verse 5. It says, who are the fathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Now what's Paul saying here? He doesn't understand why Israel as a whole has rejected Christ. You know what burdens my heart sometimes? You ever burden over anyone who's lost? 
You ever stay up at night and not sleep? You ever, you ever, you ever stay awake and, and you pray and you cry over someone, you weep over someone? You know, it burdens my heart today to see the way our nation is going. Are you with me? Am I the only one? And it breaks my heart to, to see the Christians are being ridiculed and mocked. And they mock God and they mock Christ and they make fun of God and they make fun of Christ and they do all these things. And it just hurts me to the core to do that because I'm thinking, I've just spent eight and nine hours in God's word studying and pouring my heart over this and praying and then for them to come and just tear that out of your heart, it seems like. Doesn't that bother you? If that doesn't bother you, you need to examine your life. Did you know that? You need to examine your heart. But that bothers me. And, and what Paul is saying is it upsets him so much because they had so many privileges. Churches on every corner, uh, Christian Bibles everywhere, the Holy Bible, all these privileges they have. Folks, our nation has all these privileges today, but we're turning our back on God. We're saying we don't need you, God. We're going to shake our fist in your face and say we'll make our own rules and we'll make our own laws and we'll do our own thing and we don't need to answer to you and we don't need your advice and we don't need your help. God's going to have to get our attention. Did you know that? God's going to have to get our attention. This is something that's bothered my heart tremendously. And I hope it bothers you. I hope you take the lead from what I'm saying to you today. And I may be repeating myself today, but it's something I've just got to get off my heart here. Because Paul had a burden for the law. And he said they had so many privileges here. But Israel as a whole, they have rejected Christ. They have denied Christ. They don't want anything to do with him. They, they say, we, we don't want you. We're still waiting for our Messiah because you didn't fit the mold that we wanted to put you in. And so they rejected him. But look at the last verse. We're going to stop there at verse 5. Boy, i got a whole lot more saying. It says, whose are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all blessed God bless forever. Now let me give you one little thing, a couple of things there. It says they have the patriarchs. Christ came through the Jewish lineage. But if you look at the last part, it says of whom, it says of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God bless forever. Let me give you the literal, literal wording of that. It says the one being over all God bless forever. Are we in our translation? Who is? Same thing. But, but, but it's the one being over all God bless forever. Now the key is that grammatically, the one being, or who is, that word, and the word God, and the word bless, guess what? They're all referring to Jesus Christ. All referring to Christ. So what's Paul saying here? He's saying, you have God. God came through your lineage in the person of Jesus Christ in the flesh. God spoke to you, God the Father, but God the Son has come through your lineage and he's come through you, yet you've rejected him, yet you've denied him, yet you say, I don't want him. And he's claiming deity right here. He's saying, Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is the one you need. Folks, as we close today, I hope your heart's heavy today. I hope your heart's burdened today. And burden for those who are lost and burden for those who are unchurched. And, and you know, that's the solution for our nation, for our society today. That's a solution for, for so many things today. If we'll just get out as churches, the responsibility we have, and share Christ and preach Christ and live for Christ and, and not mess up and foul up and say, well, you know, we, we do this, but we live another way and we turn people off of Christ. Folks, we have a lot to do in this world. We have a lot to work to do as a church. It's not over with, folks. You're not on retirement. You can't just sit back and rest. You can't just sit back and let someone else do it. Get up, get involved, get busy, and get going. It's time to not be silent. It's time to move forward. It's time to move forward with the gospel. It's time to move forward with the Christian truth. That's the only thing that's going to change the hearts of people in this life. It's changing a nation one heart at a time. But you know what? As we look at this today with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we might be troubled over things, but I read in the Bible that one day, every knee is going to bow before this one we call Christ. And every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Doesn't mean they're all going to be saved. As we see here, and we'll look more tonight, Paul says, look, just because you're born a Jew doesn't mean you're saved. 
God has no grandchildren, so to speak. Just because you're born in this family or that family doesn't mean you're saved. You need a personal relationship with Christ. And folks, we have to change one heart at a time. It begins today, it begins tomorrow, it begins Tuesday, and it continues there. One heart at a time, we change. Do you care about the lost? Do you care about those who are unsaved? Are you concerned about those who are unsaved? Then what are you doing about it? Are you praying? That's great. But sometimes you have to put a little feet on your prayers. And you have to get out, you've got to move, you've got to talk, you've got to witness, you've got to do, you've got to testify, you've got to do these things. It's time to work. It's time to move forward. It's no longer time to be silent. We must speak, and we must speak loudly. And we must do it now. And God, our hearts are heavy today. Give us the burden that Paul had for the loss, that he wept and he cried and he was in anguish and sorrow. And he said, I'll do anything, whatever it takes, to see my Jewish brothers and sisters come to know Christ. Lord, help us have the same desire that Paul had. Help us to have that same burden that Paul had. And I pray today that even as we preach today your word, that there might be someone here in this congregation today that's never received Christ as Savior. And Lord, help them to realize their lost condition. And they'll repent of their sins and by faith receive Jesus Christ, that he died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. And they'll come today and make that public, placing their faith and trust in Christ and following him in the waters of baptism, becoming a part of this church family. And Lord, that's our greatest desire today. It's not that we might build a bigger building. It's not that we might have more of this or more of that, but that we might see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they'll have a relationship with him, a vital, healthy relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, there may be others here today that you've led to become a part of this church. We, we invite them today, Father. Maybe people need to come rededicate, recommit their lives to you, whatever it may be today, Father. Help us. Help us to have the burden. Help us to have the desire. Help us to be challenged today. That when we leave out of here today, that we don't lose that, but we keep that fire burning in our hearts and in our minds. Because we know Jeremiah was ready to quit. But he said, I've got a desire, I've got a burning in my bones that I just can't put out. And I hope that's us today. God help us today, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What number? The name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet.